I'm going to read you a little story while the ushers are getting stuff ready for the offering and while you're getting your heart ready. Um, Shortly after the Dallas Theological Seminary was founded in 1924, this is a true story, I believe, uh, it neared bankruptcy. Creditors were threatening foreclosure at noon on a given day. Needless to say, the administrators and faculty gathered for prayer in the office of seminary president Lewis Sperry Schaefer. One of those present was Harry Ironside, well-known preacher, lecturer, and Bible commentator. In his characteristic style, Dr. Ironside prayed, Lord, we know that the cattle on a thousand hills are thine. Please sell some of them and send us the money. <laughs> During the prayer meeting, rancher in boots, a rancher in boots and open neck shirt stopped in the business office and announced, I just sold two carloads of cattle in Fort Worth. I've been trying to make a business deal, but it fell through, and I feel compelled to give the money to the seminary. I don't know if you need it or not, but here's the check. The secretary took the check and tapped quietly on the door of Dr. Schaefer's office. When someone finally answered, she handed the check to Schaefer, who noted that it was made out for the exact amount of their debt. Furthermore, he recognized the name of the Fort Worth cattleman, so he turned to Dr. Ironsides and said, Harry, God sold the cattle. <laughs> so uh, I pray that y'all will be praying for God to sell some cattle so we can pay off our debt in our building. We've been working on it a while, and the girl's been praying about it, and, and we know it's coming, but we're just waiting for some of y'all to recognize that God has some cattle he wants you to sell. Amen? I want to read you another little story while they're doing that. Uh, this is a, uh, boy, they go through in a hurry, don't they? Uh, this is a uh, memo to Jesus, son of Joseph, wood, wood carver and carpenter shop in Nazareth, and it's from the Jordan Management Consultants of Jerusalem. Dear sir, thank you for submitting the resume of the 12 men you've picked to manage, for management positions in your new organization. All of them have taken our battery of tests. We have not only run the results through our computer, but also arranged personal interviews for each of them with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultants. It's the staff opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and, voc and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you are undertaking. They do not uh, have the team concept. We would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience in managerial ability and proven capability. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, placed, pa placed personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine the morale. We feel that it's our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James, the son of Alphaeus and uh, Thaddeus, definitely have uh, radical leanings, and they both register a high score on the manic depressive scale. <laughs> One of the candidates, however, shows great potential. He's a man of ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, has a, a keen business mind, and has contacts in high places. He's highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All of the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new venture. So you ought to take heart at that. You know, if that bunch can, uh, can spread the gospel all over their part of the world, and uh, most of them end up being martyred for Jesus, what can we do? Amen? Um, let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the day. I thank you for all the folks that you've brought here specifically on this day to hear this specific word, Father. And Lord, I just ask you to pour your anointing into this message, pour your anointing into me, and, and give me the right thoughts and the right things to, to say and to do, Father, to to bring this message home, Lord. I believe, it, I believe it's an important message that can change our lives. And I just ask you to use it, Father. You say that your word that you send forth will accomplish the purpose that you send it forth for, and it will not return to you void. So, Lord, accomplish all the purposes in us today that this word has for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 
If you haven't been here for a while or if you're new, we're finishing up, I think finishing up today, uh, Do Not Be Deceived uh, series. And uh, it's, it's Do Not Be Deceived in, in relationships and in who you are and in a lot of different ways. Uh, we started out with just an introduction uh, about uh, four or five weeks ago. Uh, then we had a, a message on the, the signals you're sending, the messages you're sending. And then we had one on uh, conditioning, how you get conditioned to send the wrong me- messages and, and how the person that you're trying to communicate with may have been conditioned to, to communicate in a, a way that's not fully uh, good for, for communication. And uh, last week, we had a short one on being fully convinced. How many of you know that you need to be fully convinced in everything about the Word of God? You need to come to your own conviction before God about every truth in the Bible. And today, we're talking about, uh, and, and understand this is not an absolute thing, okay, but I titled it Primary Cause and Cure of bad relationships. And that's not, it's not all encompassing in that it's the only primary cause and the only cure, but, but it, these are some of the main causes and, and the cure is, is pretty absolute. You can't get well without this cure. Uh, it, it's, it's really primary to, to getting along with folks and having the right communication. See, the problem with communication and relationships, it, to a large degree, uh, it's, it's a fact that most people speak at a rate of around 200 words per minute. And I know some of you speak a lot faster than that. And I know some of you speak a lot slower than that. And the slower you speak, the bigger the problem may be, okay? Because it's also a known fact that the average person listens as fast as 800 words a minute. How many of you can subtract 200 from 800? What do you get? 600. You know, 600 is a big part of the problem. Because if you're talking to me at 200 words a minute, and I'm able to listen to 800 words a minute, then, you know, I'm kind of... And sometimes I actually sense this when somebody's talking and and I'm in a hurry or something, and I'm thinking, well, come on, get to the point. Let, come on, get it out. I'm not at home, you know, but, but other people. <laughs> but... but uh, I have to protect myself. But, uh, but it leaves a gap there because I, I have room to do other things while you're talking at 200 words a minute. Uh, because I'm, and what kind of things do I do during that, that kind of space between how fast you're talking and how fast I can listen and my brain's working very fast? What, what do I do in that interim? What? My, well, it does, but what does it think about? You know, I, it tends to... To, um, to, to go to the, the, the best place for, for having problems in a relationship. Uh, you know, I can, I can wander to, to what you're saying and why you're saying it. Why are you saying this to me? And, wh- and what does it mean, you know? Those are two questions that, that you should wait till they get through talking to find the answer to, right? What, why are you telling me this? And, and what do you mean by it? Do you ever wonder when somebody's talking to you, well, what do you mean by that? Hello? I'm the only one. Okay. So uh, what I've got today is, uh, and usually when, when they finish talking and, and I finish judging why they're saying it and what they really mean, then I react, right? And, and if I react without asking any questions, where does it usually go? I react, and then they react to my reaction, and here we go. Anybody ever been there? Anybody in there ever been there lately? Hello? Okay, well then you might be interested in today's message. Uh, I'm going to give you ten uh, things that I believe we, we really need to learn, actually that we must learn, and, and we must believe them, if you want your relationships with God and with other people around you to, to glorify God. 
So uh, I, I was just going to read these, but I thought, you know, seeing's better than hearing, and, and hearing and seeing together is, is pretty good. So I put them on a PowerPoint again, and, uh, and, and the red is, is what you're supposed to say. The black is what I'm going to say. There are some things that we need to understand. Oh, I'm so glad you asked, because I really want to tell you, because I think they're important. Uh, so we need to understand that how you or me sees this world is not how it really is. It's just how you see it. You know, if you could get that through, no, excuse me, if we could get that through our thick skulls, let me rephrase that. Y'all may not have thick skulls. If I could get through that through my thick skull, I'd have a lot less problems in this world. Because, you know, we look at the world around us and, and we think we know that that's reality. But it's only my reality. And you can't laugh because it's your reality too. And it may not be reality, it's just your reality. Because you see that in a lot of different ways. Uh, we need to understand that most of us tend to think people do things to us. Yes or no? Yes. Well, you know, much of the time, in reality, they're just doing them, and we just happen to be there. How would that help you if you could assume that they weren't doing it to you, but you just happened to be there and, and overheard it? Hello? Next one. We need to understand that how I or we see the world depends on how I see myself and how I feel about myself. Do you understand that that's the, probably the biggest single influence in how you see and react to those things around you? How you see yourself and how you feel about yourself interferes more than, than many other things in the relationships that you have with people and how they end up. Next one. We need to understand that how I see myself and feel about myself is determined by my life experiences. In other words, my hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And it's also determined by my ignorance of what and who God says I am or my inability to believe and accept that. Some of us know what God says about who we are, don't we? But how many of you truly, truly, truly in your spirit, in your heart, and in your being believe and accept what he says about you? We sang that song a while ago, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And uh, I wish I could see into your hearts to see how many of you really truly believe that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And, and even if we know that we're supposed to be, it's hard for us to accept it, receive it, and believe it, and keep on believing it. Any of you ever come to believe it a little bit, and then in a day or two, you, it's kind of gone? Kind of like with Scripture where it talks about the man that looks in his at his face in the mirror, and then when he's gone away, he forgets what he looked like. That's kind of the way that is with, with true righteousness uh, and how God sees us. We can see it, we can hear it, we can know that it's the truth because God said it, but we can't seem to quite wrap our head around receiving it and feeling it. Next one. Uh, we need to understand that, that that situation of not knowing who we are and... and uh, and what we're about, and what God thinks about us, that activates my buttons. How many of you have buttons? How many of you have more than one buttons? How many of you have a whole panel of buttons? Oh, look at the buttons on, on Ron's shirt there. Man, he's full of buttons. Punch one of those buttons, Florence. He just laughed on that one. I'm glad she didn't punch one of the other ones. Uh, but, but it activates the buttons, and I react... When somebody pushes my button and I don't know, I don't feel good about myself and I don't know what God says about me and I don't have that, and somebody hits one of my buttons and I react to defend myself, justify my actions and convince myself and others that I'm a good person, that I'm not wrong. And, and as others react to my reaction, eventually the relationship's damaged, disrupted or destroyed altogether. 
Does, does that resonate with anybody? That's what we do a lot of the time. And in fact, probably the majority of the time that we have problems in relationship, we're trying to prove to ourselves and to others some things that, that we don't like about ourselves. Or I'm reacting out of something somebody did to me a long time ago and I'm, I'm going to sidetrack you so you can't do the same thing to me. Or I'm going to give you a reason to reject me. I'm going to give you a reason to do something ugly to me so I can reject you. Uh, those kind of things are just, most of them uh, come out of not liking ourselves, not knowing who we are, not knowing the truth about who God says I am. See, if, if I am what God says I am, and you say that I'm something different from that, if I really know that I am what God says I am, I don't have to prove anything to you because I know who I am. And I do. I know who I am. God showed me. He revealed to me who I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Period. Paragraph. There's nothing you can do about it no matter what you think about me. There's not even anything I can do about it. And I feel it and understand it that much. So I don't usually, occasionally, you know, we're all, how many of you know we're all human, including me? I know y'all know I'm human. But, but occasionally, you know, I react wrong. But most of the, if somebody says something about me or is derogatory about me or calls me a name or something, it doesn't bother me. It truly doesn't. Because I know that Jesus loves me. Jesus died for me. Jesus took my sin away 2,000 years ago. And I, whether you like it or not, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. And that makes it so much easier for me to relate to people and, and see, I know some things about you too. Uh, it's, it's pretty difficult for some of y'all to get under my skin. Uh, but, and the reason is, is because if I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and you profess to be a Christian, and you've trusted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, then you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus too. Now, I'm righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and I make mistakes. So how can I... Get on to you if you make a mistake. How can I react wrong to you if you make a mistake? I think there's another one. We need to understand, at least most of us, most of us know we need to change. How many of you know you, there's some things, more than one in your life that you need to change? Well, we need to change the behaviors in our lives so we work on the behaviors, don't we? How many of you trying to change some behaviors? Some of you just don't like to raise your hand or you're not sure whether it's a trick question. But, you know, if we're not working to change some things in our lives, we're not making much progress. But, but most of us work on changing the behaviors and we fail. And if you fail often enough, you quit. Don't you? Next one. Well, we need to understand that when we learn the truth and accept the truth, and keep believing the truth, no matter what goes on in your life, your life will change. That's really weak. Your life will change. Do you believe that? Yes. Okay, then I got one more question for you. We need to understand that you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How many of you know that scripture? Hallelujah. Well, uh, Exactly which truth do you have to know for that to happen? How much of you know some truth? How many of you know the truth, that Jesus is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life? See, Jesus is the truth. But just knowing Jesus doesn't always set you free, does it? I mean, it does, but we don't know it, so we don't accept it, and we don't get free. How many of you know if you think you're in bondage, you might be in bondage? Hello? So... Exactly which truth do we need to know to be free? His truth. Huh? His truth. Okay. <laughs> the truth, we need to understand the truth about what Jesus really did for us, the truth about how God sees you, and, and that it's because of what Jesus really did for you. And I submit to you that, that I'm not judging you, but... but I run into so many people that say they know that, but they don't really 
know it. They don't really believe it all the time in their spirit. They, don't, they, they can't believe. It's too good to be true. If we, know, if we know what that really is, it's too good to be true, so we can't accept it. But if you can't accept what, what God really did for you, and if you can't accept the truth about God, who, see, how God sees you, and what he says that Jesus did for you, if you can't accept that, you're going to have trouble relating to people around you. Is there another one? So don't give up. Identify your wrong behavior. But don't work on changing the behaviors. Hello? And don't get excited. I thought some of you would probably get upset if I said don't work on the behaviors. What do you want me to stay like I am? Oh, heavens no. <laughs> heavens no. How many of you want the one sitting next to you to stay exactly the way they are? Hello? That was kind of reserved, wasn't it? Next one. Is there another one? Galatians 5.20, 2 Corinthians 5.21. We had trouble with Corinthians and Galatians this morning in a Bible study. Y'all are missing some good Bible studies. We almost went through this whole series this morning. 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for me that I might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Amen. And when I say I'm the righteousness of God in, G in Christ, uh, he made me the righteousness of God. He became sin for me so that I could be what he made me to be, which is the righteousness of God. I am the righteousness of God. Are you the righteousness of God? How many of y'all have trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Then, then if you've done that, whether you know it, believe it, and understand it or not, your sin was on him 2,000 years ago, and you now are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But if you don't know that, it doesn't do you much good. Hello? I'm still here. Don't, don't hit your, your thing. Um, it doesn't do you much good if you don't know it and understand it. You can't, you can't utilize it. You can't benefit from it. It's still there, but you don't have fun. You don't enjoy it. You're too busy putting out fires in relationships and trying to, to, to make yourself presentable to people and trying to, to be something that you are, but you don't know it. And, and it just convolutes everything and it messes up all the relationships. Um, so now that we got that all up on the table, um, just, just don't give up. Identify your wrong behaviors uh, and don't work on changing the behaviors. But there's some scriptures that tell us what we do need to work on. Look at Galatians 5, 16. And I'm going to try to go through this quickly, but not too quickly, because this is, this is the, to me, the, the, the message of freedom. This is the truth. These scriptures contain the truths that we need to understand in order to really be free. And when I learned these truths 13 years ago, uh, 13 or 14, somewhere along there, uh, God set me free in a way that I never imagined I could be free. So I want you to, to listen carefully, and I'm praying God will open your eyes. Galatians 5, 16. Um, Paul's talking to him. He says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh lusts against, uh, against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. How many of you got that problem that you do some things you wish you didn't do and you don't do the things you wish you would do? Well, how many of you know when you're, when you're aiming at something, we got any hunters in here? Deer season's coming on strong. Uh, how many of you know when you're aiming at something, if you put your sights on it and you focus on it and you got a good scope and it's not too far away, that, that you can hit the target? Well, what if you just, like I did the first time I went deer hunting, what if you just kind of get it in the scope kind of generally, you know, and then you close your eyes and pull the trigger? Gut shot. 
out. It's the first deer I ever killed them. So I was young, so the other guys had to clean it. And they were really, they said, when I first fired, they said, great shot, great shot, right in the neck. I said, when I opened my eyes, I said, well, where is it? Oh, well, it just went over in the bushes. It's just 10 feet away. Well, it took an hour to find it. And it went in here. It was facing me head on, and I aimed at the neck. But it went in here, and it came out here. And if you've hunted and cleaned deer, you know that's a big mess. And, and I wasn't even trained enough or anything. That's my first deer hunting, so I wasn't going to clean the deer. But they had to clean it, and I was not their favorite person. And, and that's what happens in relationships if we don't know who we are. We gut shoot it, and it's all ugly, and it's all nasty and dirty, and, and it's not fun. And, and it leaves a, a bad impression in our spirit that, that manifests itself over and over and over. Amen? Uh, but you, you usually do what you focus on. Do y'all, do y'all understand the truth of that? I heard a story about a guy that had a birthday party for his kid and had a whole bunch of kids over. And he had, must have been pretty wealthy. He had a nice house and swimming pool and stuff. And, and he was a Christian and he went to church regular. And, and he was studying about uh, focusing what you focus on. And he was... He was trying to learn about sin and not sin and so forth. And, and so he took all these kids out there and, uh, and he gathered them all together before just as the party was starting. And he said, okay now, children. He says, I, I want you to have a good time here. We have a swimming pool. We want you to swim in a swimming pool. We have lots of cake and ice cream. We want you to eat all the cake and ice cream you want. We've got games galore. We want you to, we want you to have a good time. We, we just really want you to enjoy our home and enjoy the the other children, and, and we're going to have some more food after a while. We, do, we want you to have all you want, and in and out of the pool, anything you want to do around here that's not going to hurt anybody, we want you to have fun. But, but do you see this flower bed right here? See the flowers in the flower? See the flower bed? They all say, oh, yeah, we see it. He says, I do not want you to spit in that flower bed. Please do not spit in the flower bed. And, and he, said, he said, have a good time, enjoy the pool, enjoy everything we have, enjoy the games, the trampoline and all that stuff, but do not spit in the flower bed. And he gave them a good talking to. And then when he was through, he said, okay, kids, go have a good time. And then he went in the house, and they had a curtain there that you could see through, and he went in the house and stood behind the curtain. And he said, every child not only spat in the flower bed, but most of them spat in it twice. And even his own kids who knew about what he was going to do spat in the garden. Every one of them. Why? Because he focused them on it. And if you're focusing on the things that you shouldn't do, that you don't want to do, if you're focusing on the, the bad issues and actions in your life, you're going to do them. Because that's where your focus is. We've got to learn to focus on what God said about us and who we are. Verse 18 says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. That's why Jesus took us out from under the law so we don't have to focus on the law, so we don't have to worry about keeping all of those don'ts and don'ts and do's and don'ts and don'ts and hundreds of them and hundreds of them. If we focus on that, we're going we're gonna to do most of them. But if we focus on the good things that God says about us and who we are, and if we believe that, and if we focus on the good things that he said to do that are good for us, how many of you know that's going to change your life? Hello? That's what this is all about. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under law. Uh, Galatians uh, 5.19 says, now the, the works of the flesh are evident. How many of you know that? Do I need to go through all the things that, that are the works of the flesh? Y'all know what the works of the flesh are, don't you? Do any of you focus on the works of the flesh? You know, this list, most of us don't have a lot of problem with. Uh, the works of the flesh are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy. Some of us might have a little trouble. Outbursts of wrath or anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies. Some of us might have a few problems with some of them, right? How many of you focus on trying not to get angry before? How many of you made up your mind, I'm never going to get angry again? Did you get angry again? Hello? Uh, 
He said, just as I told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Practice those things. Those who practice those things. If you're practicing them, you're going to do them. You're going to focus on them. They're going to be the focus of your life and you will not be able to not do them. That's the reason I said don't start working on your bad behaviors. Don't focus on your bad behavior. Focus on on right behaviors. Focus on Jesus. Focus on what Jesus did for you and and what he made you into. Verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. There is no law. You know what that means, that there is no law? It means you can do those things all you want to. You can do them all you want to. You don't have to try not to do those. And if you've got the spirit of the living God living in you, and if you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, you don't even have to try to do them. But you're free to do them as much as you please. Love, joy, peace. How many of you want more of all three of those? Gentleness, kindness, long-suffering, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. How many of you want some more of that? Focus on the fruit of the Spirit. Focus on doing the good things. Focus on trying to to maintain those things. Uh, Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Why do you think he put that at the end of that sentence? Because those are the things that we save people who are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus still have a little bit of problem with. Most of those others we don't have problems with, do we? As Christians. Occasionally somebody gets caught up in something, but, but I, I won't, no, I better not do that. Uh, y- y'all know who's conceited and who provokes one another and who envies one another. I don't, I don't have to point anything out there, do I? Hello? Uh, see, you know what works of the flesh is? Works of the flesh is trying to be what God wants you to be in your own strength or in your own flesh. That's what works of the flesh are. Uh, And and it's also uh, considered works of the flesh if you're trying to gain something from God by what you do or don't do. If you think that something you do or don't do will get you something from God, that's a work of the flesh. It's dead works. It's, it's of no value. How many of you think you can do something that will just make God just pour blessings out on you? You can. You just have to believe in His Son. You have to believe that all of your sins are gone and that you're worthy to receive His blessings because you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Hello? Hello? You know, we can help him to change us as we start seeking the good things and seeking him and understanding who we are. But he's the one that does the changes. We can, we can speed it up or slow it down. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. You know, if you really want to be successful... Just make a commitment right now. From now on, every time I deal with anybody, whether it's, whether it's Aaron or Ron or Clark or, or anybody, any of you, every time I deal with you, I'm going to ignore your flesh. I'm going to deal with you according to the Spirit. The Spirit of God lives in you, and I'm going to ignore everything about your flesh. I'm going to ignore, you, ignore your tone of voice. I'm going to ignore the volume of your voice. I'm going to ignore all your body language. I'm just going to listen to the Spirit, and I'm going to know the Spirit of God is in you. I'm not going to let anything you do offend me, because I'm not going to deal with you according to the flesh. I'm going to deal with you according to the Spirit of God that's in you and in me. Would that change your life? Woo! I think it would. I think it would. Um... According to the flesh, yet now, 
Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him no longer. How come? How come do we know him no longer according to the flesh? Because his flesh died and he rose a spiritual being. Are we spiritual beings? Amen. We need to act like spiritual beings, don't we? And, and, and know each other according to the Spirit. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and you've got to listen to this. How many of you are in Christ? Okay. If any of you are in Christ, if you work hard enough, you can become a new creation. If you try hard enough. Therefore, if anyone in Christ, he what? Is, is a new creation. And, and if you if you studied being a new creation long enough, uh, the old things will pass away. Someday. Someday they'll go. They're, they're gone. Old things have passed away. Behold, a few things. Oh, all things? What, what's all things? So all things are new in you, right? All things have become new. Are you a new creature? Creation? Are you, are you a new creature in Christ Jesus? Are you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Well, if you are, one day you're going to start acting like it. The more you believe it, the more you accept it, the more you, you keep on believing it, the quicker you change and the more you start acting like what you really are. And that's what we need to focus on. Uh, behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God. What? All things are of God. Who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. How many of you believe that statement? How long has it been since you did something that you thought would get you more favor from God? Hmm? You don't have to raise your hand. But I know some of us in the last few weeks have done things that we thought would make God really like us and really approve us and really proud of us. And he might even bless us more because we did them. If that's you, those are works of the flesh. They won't get you anything. They will get you nothing. The only thing you get from God, they asked Jesus, they said, what must we do to do the, to, to do the works of God? And Jesus said, believe on the one he sent. It didn't say work. It didn't say struggle. It just said, believe on the one he sent. Amen? Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. You and I are supposed to be passing on that ministry of reconciliation by reconciling with each other when there's a problem and helping others to reconcile with each other when there's a problem. And sometimes we have to teach people who they really are so that they can get started on it, okay? Because you'd be surprised how many people in the world do not know this truth and do not understand it. Uh, he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Amen. Now, I got to tell you, that right there is the reason, one of the reasons why you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He took all of our sins on the cross. He took the sins of the world on the cross. And, and that covered all the things that we've done. And now he says, I'm not imputing your trespasses to you. Do you know what that means? Do you know how he did that? He did that because he took you out from under the law. He no longer judges you by the law. He, he gives you grace. And he doesn't impute them to you. One of the scriptures said he, he remembers our sins no more. And, and I used to not think that through far enough. And I used to say, isn't it great he doesn't remember our sins? But somebody reminded me not long ago, you know, how can God forget anything? He's God. And when you study that word, it doesn't really mean that he forgot them. It says that, that he forgets our sins. But that word means that he doesn't 
do anything about it. He doesn't take them into account. He, it's, it's as if we didn't do it. Okay, that's what Jesus did for us. And that's the only reason that we can be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. There's nothing in and of ourselves that we can do to make us righteous. Is anybody getting this? Not imputing their trespasses to them, trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. How many of y'all are reconcilers? How many of you work at staying reconciled to your brothers and sisters. You know, the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And I submit to you, you can't really do that until you really understand this truth of what God did for you. It changed my view of God when, when I realized that he really made me the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He really took away all of my sin on the cross and he really didn't count any of them against me anymore ever. And I stay righteous in his eyes, not necessarily in yours. Y'all know I'm human, you know I mess up. Some of you know more than others how much I mess up. But, uh, but you mess up too. But it doesn't keep you from being the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus in God's eyes. And when you get that, when I got that, man, I had this weight on my shoulders all of my adult life, just worrying about whether I was, whether I was measuring up to God and doing what He wanted me to do. And, and I worked hard at doing stuff without even understanding I was trying to gain his approval. You can be walking in legalism and not know it. And if you don't know that you're righteous, it's just not a fun life. Amen? You may have a good life. You may have some fun. But you always got this little thing hanging over your shoulder. You know, what, what if I died without confessing one of my sins or something, you know? Well, God will look at you and say, what sins? Hello? When you understand it. Because it's not about sin anymore. It's whether you believe on Him. Uh, now, verse 20, Now, then, we are ambassadors for Christ. And as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's what you ought to be telling people if you are a reconciler. If you, he made you a reconciler, that's what you need to be telling him. Uh, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the one we had up there at the last that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Look at Galatians 2.6. As you therefore, Colossians 2.6. There you go. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Now, did you see what verse 7 said? Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Do you know what that means? Anybody? It means accept and believe what he says he did for you. As being established in the faith means that you know that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you don't know that, I don't think you're fully established in the faith because that's the main thing he did for us. That, he did that so he could have a relationship with us. And, and we may be trying to have a relationship with him, but if we're trying to earn that relationship, we get so convoluted messing around with it and trying to work it out and trying to understand how he could love me and my old rotten self. Well, my old rotten self's dead, okay? I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things pass away and all things are new, including me, okay? I'm a new creature. And if you study that out, it doesn't mean that he just, he just kind of made you the same and new. He made you into a different creature, a different being. You're a spiritual being now. You're a child of the Most High God and you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 
You're not what you were. And you may not, you may not be all that you hope to be or you're going to be. We've got a song about that. But you're sure not what you used to be, okay? Amen. But we are going to be what we, what we want to be and what he made us to be if we focus on what he did for us. Amen? Uh, but beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy, empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. That word over there that we looked at, established, built up, rooted, and established. Established means set up or on a firm or permanent foundation. It means to show something to be true or certain by determining the facts. Or in this case, receiving and understanding the facts and believing them. It means achieving permanent acceptance or recognition. Your relationship with God is permanent. It's founded on a rock. It's founded on the blood of Jesus. It's founded on the resurrection of Jesus. And we gotta, we got to get to the place where we know that we're complete in Him and that He is the head over all power and principality. Romans 4.13 For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are, are under the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promises is made of no effect. See, if you're dependent on the law to make yourself good enough to deserve God's promises, it don't work. It doesn't do you any good. It's of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath. How many of you want some of God's wrath? Isaiah says that under the new covenant, his wrath won't come against us. If anything bad comes against us, it's not from him. And it's, you, you know where it's usually from, right? Things I do. Uh, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. You need to get that in your spirit right there. Some of these verses you need to put on your refrigerator. You need to put them on three by five cards. You need to memorize them. You need to meditate on them. If you have trouble believing that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, meditate on these scriptures. Ask God to reveal them to you and go over them and over them and over them until you get them in your spirit, until you know that you know that you know that you are a new creature in Christ Jesus, that old things did pass away, that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that he loves you no matter how you mess up or how many times you mess up. When, you know, when you mess up, it doesn't break your fellowship with God. It doesn't, it doesn't make him not love you. It sometimes brings us some bad issues into our life depending on how we mess up. And then we have to reap what we sowed. But God still loves us and he still wants to bless us and he still will bless us. Amen. Uh, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Y'all do know that in Romans it says that, that he took you out from under the law of sin and death. Do we know that? Do we understand that? That God doesn't judge us by the law any longer. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be according, according to grace that the promise might be sure. Hello? The promise is sure. You know what sure means? Sure, that word means that which does not fail or waver. It's immovable and on which one may rely. The promises of God are sure. Period. Paragraph. To all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Romans 5. Verse, uh, verse 7 says, for scarcely, for scarcely for a righteous man one will die. Why would you die for a righteous man? He's going to go to heaven if he dies. Uh, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners before we came out from under the law, while we were still sinning under the law, 
Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. These are all the things that God did for you, that Jesus did for you on that cross. He made provision for us. And, and it's, it's just so sad to me how many people don't get it, don't receive it, don't understand it, uh, and don't enjoy it. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. You think that's enough? But he says, and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom someday if we stick it out, we'll receive the reconciliation. What? How many of you have it now? Some of y'all slow going up there. How many of you have it now? All right. How many of you know that you know that you know that you have it now? Let me hold them up there. I've got to see if it's time to go home. Yeah. <laughs> now, somebody didn't raise their hand. We can't quit. Uh, through whom we have now received, past tense, and that means taken or accepted, the reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin... And thus death separated all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed, and that means charged to, taken into account or considered. Sin is not charged to you. It's not taken into account or considered about you when there is no law. You know, the law is still out there. You know that, don't you? I mean, people are still living under the law. The law didn't go away, but the law is not for you if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You come out from under the law. You're either under law or grace. Now, where do you want to be? Amen. Aren't we glad we're under grace? Romans 6, 1. I'm, I'm working towards getting through. Romans 6, 1 says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may, ama may abound? Certainly not. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? But you see, if you're still trying not to sin because you think it gets you some from God, then, then you're really just still spinning your wheels. You, you're, you're on, you ever been on a, a real slick, clay, wet surface in a, in a vehicle? And you push the accelerator and it just goes, Wurr! and you don't go anywhere. That's where you are if you don't understand this. I think you can be saved and not understand it. But when you understand it, you get more than saved. You get filled, excited, anointed. You get happy, you get joy, you get peace. And you get busy in the kingdom when you get this. Amen? Amen. All of your inhibitions, and I used to be an introvert, uh, didn't like to talk to people, didn't like to meet people, none of that. And <laughs> ask my wife, ask my wife. I, I was for a major, major part of my life. I had gotten over some of that by the time we went through 30 years of church work and stuff, but, but I still wasn't totally comfortable, you know, just talking to people and stuff. I was always afraid I was going to say something, embarrass myself or something, and now I just don't care if I get embarrassed. <laughs> Some of you don't like that, but I don't care. I mean, I do care, but do you understand what I'm saying? You really get happy when you get a hold of this truth and the burdens come off of your shoulders and it's a new life in Christ Jesus. Uh, where was I? I could go on and on. Or do you not know, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many as of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. This is what baptism is a picture of. That as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. You've been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. Walk in it. And if you learn this, 
this lesson and receive it, this truth, you can walk in it and you can enjoy it and you can have fun and you can relax and not be so critical of yourself when you make a mistake. And you can say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for paying for that. Thank you for forgiving me for that 2,000 years ago. Thank you that, that you still love me. Thank you. you. You appreciate him so much more and you care so much more about how you live for him. Um, for we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. We're supposed to be like him in his resurrection. That we should no longer be slaves of sin. How many of y'all died with Jesus? Some of you are not sure. For he who has died has been freed from sin. When we died with him, when we were buried with him, when we were raised to walk in newness of life, we are free of sin. Thank you, Susie. Thank you. Hallelujah. See, there's a couple of us that sinned enough that we're really glad to, to be free of it. I'm surprised there was only, I'm surprised there was only a couple clapping over that. Aren't y'all glad to be freed from sin? Give God some glory. Praise Him. Thank Him. If you really get it, you'll get excited about it. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead, He dies no more. Neither do you. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died once. He died to sin once for all. You got that? He died once. He died once for all of us. He's not dying again. There's no other way you can get rid of your sins except to go to him to the cross. Amen? He died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also... You also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know what reckon means? What happens when you reconcile your bank account? Well, maybe, maybe you don't want to go there. Uh, reconcile. Reconcile means to, to count it as so, to determine, to deduct, to suppose, to take into account. It means to, when you reckon yourselves to be dead indeed, it means you come to know for absolute certain that you died with Christ and that when he was raised from the dead, you were raised to de from the dead to walk in newness of life. You reckon it to be so. I know that it's so. And it doesn't mean you're never going to mess up again because you're human. But you're not going to mess up as much. You're not going to mess up as bad. And the scale's going to be going better and better and better and better and better and better and better. And your life's going to get better and better and better. Your joy's going to get better and better and better. Your relationship with your wife will get better and better and better. And that doesn't mean it'll never hit a snag. Praise the Lord. Hello? We're never going to be perfect until we're face to face with Him. But we get closer and closer and closer by focusing on what he did for us, by focusing on who he says I am and believing it and accepting it and walking in it. Romans, uh, Romans 10, 3. For they, okay, for they, who's they? Let me read a couple of more words and you'll know. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness... So many people are ignorant of his righteousness. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. See, if you accept this and, and get it in your spirit and walk in it, then, then you're uh, submitting to the righteousness of God. You're saying, God, my righteousness is filthy rags. I accept your righteousness. And thank you for making me righteous because I could never do it. And I don't know if y'all ever could, but I know I couldn't, and I never would have. I would have just walked miserably trying to please God. But when I found out, and, and I can say it like Paul, nobody taught it to me. I just, he got me to study in the Word, and he just took me from here to there to yonder to Romans to Hebrews 
to Galatians, to Ephesians, and, and he finally got through my thick skull that I wasn't under the law. And that's how it can say in, in John, uh, 1 John or 2 John, it says, if you know God, you don't sin, and if you sin, you don't know God. That statement blew my mind when I saw it before I learned this. Because I said, I sin all the time, but I think I know God. Hello? You're not under the law. That's the only reason that you don't sin. He took you out from under the law. And he doesn't count your trespasses against you. Where there is no law, there is no sin. But uh, they couldn't establish their own righteousness and they didn't submit to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Do you believe? Are you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? You need, to, uh, you need to go home and read Hebrews. I'm going to read Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9, 22. I'll quit after this, okay? According to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Blood has to be shed for the remission of sins. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven uh, should, should be purified with these but the heavenly things themselves with a better sacrifice than these. You know what the heavenly things themselves are? Us. Us. These things had to be cleansed with a better sacrifice. For Christ has not entered the holy place uh, made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for me and you for us, not that he should enter himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have to have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the age, he has appeared, he, Jesus, has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it is appointed for men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And to the, how many of y'all eagerly waiting for Jesus to come back? It says to those who eagerly await for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin. He's coming a second time without regard to sin. He's not coming back to see if you're sinning. He's coming back to see if you really believe and if you're waiting for him and expecting him. That's what he's coming back for. Amen? I lied. Titus, <laughs> Titus 1, 15 and 16, then I'll quit. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified from every good work. Did you get it? If you're working to get something from God, if you're working to please God, uh, it disqualifies you. Amen? How many of you got something out of that? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, is there anybody here? You know, you, you, have, to, you have to have a relationship with him. You have to have met him firsthand. Uh, and trusted in him in order to be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So if you've never done that, you know, you need to do that so that you can then say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and then you can enjoy life. Amen? So if there's anybody here that's never made that transition, that's never come to Jesus and, and said, Jesus, I want you to be my personal Lord and Savior. I want to trust you and accept you. And, and this sounds so unbelievable, but I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I want to be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I want all my sins gone. I want to be able to enjoy life and people around me. Is there anybody here that wants to do that today? It's so simple. It's so easy. It's just, I'll introduce you to Jesus and you to him and him to you. And that's, that's what it means to get saved. It's just to meet him. And then you spend the rest of your life getting to know him better and better and better. Anybody at all that wants to pray a prayer and let me introduce you to Jesus. Amen. Well, is there anybody here that has trouble believing 
what we talked about. You know it's the Bible, you know it's true, but you have trouble believing it in your heart and applying it to you. Is there anybody like that that would like for me to pray for you? Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Well, I'm going to pray for y'all. Father, in the name of Jesus, those that raise their hand that say they have trouble accepting it, I just ask you, Father, to wrap your arms around them right now. I ask you to pour your anointing into them, Father. I ask you to show them their, their white robe that you put around us after you take the sin away from us, Father. Lord, I ask you to renew their mind. I ask you to just, just let them believe it, Father. Lord, help their unbelief. And Lord, help them to take their eyes off of themselves and the things that, that they see in themselves and know about themselves that keep them from believing that you can make them righteous, Father. And let them know that you overcame all of that. You took all of it on the cross, Father. And let them know that they are right now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, Father. And get it in their spirit so much that the devil can't get it out. He can't question it. He can't use it against them or anything, Father. Let them just be able to confess, I am, and let them believe it. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And they all said? Amen. Hallelujah, glory.